Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week I speak with citizen change makers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Stephen Wertheim. He is a co-founder and the research director of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, which officially just launched this week. I've been thinking about foreign policy and how it affects American democracy right here at home. The Quincy Institute is arriving just in time. Its founders conceived of an action-oriented think tank to build the foundation for a new foreign policy that is both sensible and humane, something that reflects American society as a whole, whether progressive or conservative, and is centered on diplomatic engagement and military restraint. Responsible statecraft should derive from serious consideration of the public interest accounting for the diversity of American society, and it should be democratic. It should include not just us, but a robust and inclusive public debate, as well as a strong role for Congress as our constitutional republic demands. And then we talk about responsible statecraft as something that will engage the world, mainly through peaceful intercourse and build a peaceful world. We'll be talking about why we need to reinvigorate diplomacy for world peace and the consequences of our international engagement for our own democracy here in the United States. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. Good to be with you. You created the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft with some colleagues. How do you define responsible statecraft? We created the Quincy Institute because we look back at at least several decades of history that we've all lived through, and the five of us who co-founded it realized that the United States had come to a point where we accept war as a normal state of affairs and relegate peace to some kind of exception, and we thought this was perverse. Our starting point in thinking about responsible statecraft was that we want peace to be the norm and war the exception. So responsible statecraft has several principles that amount to an argument, first of all, about who should be making American foreign policy, and secondly, about what the substance of American foreign policy should be. One of the problems with our foreign policy has been that a narrow elite has defined America's place in the world and forgot about the needs and aspirations of their own society responsible statecraft should derive from serious consideration of the public interest accounting for the diversity of American society, and it should be democratic. It should include not just us, but a robust and inclusive public debate, as well as a strong role for Congress as our constitutional republic demands. Something that will engage the world mainly through peaceful intercourse and build a peaceful world. Responsible statecraft abhors war. It kills people. It maims people. It devastates communities. And if it has to be used, it should be used for truly worthy purposes and as a last resort. Can you give us a little bit of a historical background as to how we have found ourselves here after many decades where essentially we appear to have endless war. We've been in Afghanistan for 18 years, which seemed inconceivable at the time when the war was started. Well, the United States first adopted a role for itself of global military supremacy in World War II, and that continued into the Cold War. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, what happened is that the United States did not use that opportunity to declare victory and therefore pull back militarily from its role. Instead, it decided, having built up what President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex, to pursue greater military hegemony than ever. I think that is the source of our proximate problems today. The United States decided that it enjoyed unipolar primacy, that it could not countenance any challengers like the Soviet Union had been, and that this happy state of affairs would continue forevermore if only the United States could maintain a, such a great margin of a dominance over potential rivals that they would be deterred 
even from rising themselves or from pursuing interests that clash with those of the United States. This incredibly ambitious role and this militarized role of the United States caused us to find enemies that could in turn justify our military establishment. These enemies were not very significant threats to the United States. Sometimes we made them into threats and inflated the threats that they posed. And so now we find ourselves stuck in this cycle of violence where U.S. actions produce a reaction, they generate adversaries for us, then we've got to fight those adversaries. So the question for us now is how do we break out of that cycle? Yes, indeed. So what do you propose? What are your ideas about breaking out? We have uh, formulated the Quincy Institute to bring people together who for a long time may have been objecting to the U.S. role in the war on terror and other militarized policies. We're also welcoming in people who have come to this conclusion based on the results that they've seen and are now rethinking whether U.S. military domination is something that can actually plausibly lead to peace in the world given both the state of the world and the state of our own political system in the United States. We're seeing a dangerous but also hopeful moment right now where it's clear that a massive change is underfoot in America's foreign policy, for better or worse. President Trump was elected despite being denounced by the foreign policy commentariat as an isolationist, somebody who was unfit for office. Those are pretty strong words, and the electorate either didn't care or still wanted to vote for him for other reasons and found his views on foreign policy to be good enough. That means that the terms of debate have changed. The current crop of foreign policy experts have to take a step back and think about what's caused themselves to lose legitimacy with the American public. So right now we know that some new possibility is opening up to imagine how America's role in the world could fundamentally change and become less militarized. The question is whether people can mobilize fast enough and affect political change so it actually changes the calculus of our lawmakers. Well, this brings me to a question I have about minor actors or minor troublemakers that we don't necessarily need to engage everywhere. So in your mind, who are the minor troublemakers and which are the wars that we could have avoided? The United States, since the end of the Cold War, has inflated what I call minor troublemakers into major threats. Take the famous axis of evil proclaimed by George W. Bush in the wake of 9-11. The countries included Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. None of these countries, in my view, poses a grave threat to the United States. Even the rhetoric of evil is perhaps meant to compensate for the fact that these countries don't directly threaten the United States. What we've done is to try and dominate the Middle East, if we take Iraq and Iran, contain both of them so that the United States can dominate that region by force. We have not been successful in stabilizing the region, quite the contrary. Our political system and foreign policy class has treated uh, both of these countries, first Iraq under Saddam Hussein and now Iran, as illegitimate actors in their own region. And that's set us up not just for the Iraq War of 2003, but now for this confrontation with Iran, where we are sanctioning Iran because they have complied with the agreement that the United States made with them and now have really no other option but to back down, as might be happening, or to continue to impose an economic stranglehold over their economy with who knows what happening in the future, hopefully not military action, but it remains very possible. So this history over the last couple decades has put us in this unfortunate position today. 
the problem with the U.S. search for military primacy is that it creates its own threats. This is a classic argument about imperial overstretch. Once you've abandoned the defense of the United States and the welfare of the American people as the lodestar for the use of force, it's very hard to know when to stop, and then inertia takes over. I think this is a good place for a philosophical question. Why is global dominance, or in this case, regional dominance in the Middle East, desirable? Why would Americans want that? I think this is a big disconnect that people don't understand. Why do we keep doing this? What's the point? The idea was that we could have peace through strength, that other challengers would not arise, and therefore there would be a kind of peace under America's military umbrella. But what I think we've seen in practice is that that argument simply doesn't hold. Dominance might produce peace if everything goes right, but instead the United States finds new reasons to go to war and becomes entangled in all the problems in the region, not in a way that's constructive, that can bring sides together in the pursuit of peace. Rather, the pursuit of dominance puts the United States on the side of particular parties in a region where the United States has acquired an interest uh, and then creates permanent enmities. And I think that's more or less what we're seeing right now happen in the Middle East. Well, one of the things you mentioned earlier is that one way to dislodge us is to democratize the formulation of foreign policy. And you seek to speak to the American people at large. How do you think you can do that? And how can you have a dialogue that's a really pretty complex dialogue about this topic? This is such an important question at this moment in particular. It's so important that whatever your views on foreign policy, if you have a position in foreign policy making, I urge you to engage more with the discontent or skepticism of the American public. In order to have a more democratic kind of foreign policy and have a robust public debate, experts themselves need to be more competitive. They need to present alternatives because we are operating within one paradigm. When most Americans read the op-ed pages or watch the news, they hear from people who are all in favor of U.S. military primacy. So by making a more dynamic and competitive elite on that level, hopefully we can create choice and a more vigorous exchange of ideas. We also want to reach out and speak directly with communities that are most directly affected by America's overly militarized foreign policies. I mean veterans and I mean people of color, refugee communities. We think it's very important to actually go out to where people are which American foreign policy elites used to do in the interwar period and in the middle of the 20th century. There was a great tradition of American diplomats and experts going around the country hosting debates to people with truly opposing views, presenting alternatives. So in fact, uh, we should be having a much more public and robust debate that then feeds into some momentous day-to-day -day decisions. Congress does have an important role to play, declaring war, authorizing war, and providing or withholding funds for military operations. Right now, we just don't have a functional system. And we have seen occasions where the American people have stood up. For example, when President Obama was contemplating bombing Syria in a response to the use of chemical weapons, he, on that occasion, did the right thing and said that Congress should authorize or not such a military response. At that point, through Congress, the American people was given a role to play. People called in, and members of Congress overwhelmingly heard that the public did not favor a such action. This is the way the system ought to work and start to make this a routine. So one of the reasons why we wanted to create the Quincy Institute is precisely to have a sustained effort so that we can make sure that the pressure is on over time. Well, if you want sustained effort, what does that look like? Are you going to have these debates 
all over the country? Are you going to be on television? What's your strategy? <laughs> well, we uh, very much hope to do all the above, and uh, we hope to grow as an institution once we launch. I think the immediate need, given that we face, uh, unfortunately, great dangers right now in terms of the U.S. foreign policymaking process or lack thereof, is we need to be very vocal in the public sphere on uh, shows like this one and get our message out and make clear that we have a very different way of conceiving of America's place in the world. And this is a big year for the country. It's a historic year. We're going to see an election, and there's an important debate going on in the Democratic Party about what its message in opposition to President Trump will be on foreign policy as on other issues. I think there's a window of opportunity on foreign policy, an opening to hearing something new, given the bipartisan record of failure for several decades. I think there is a sense that going to war is incredibly undemocratic. How would you say a foreign policy that is more democratic, that supports democracy here at home in the United States would look like? And sometimes it will include war, of course. What's your vision? It's a really good question. We have in our own constitution and in legislation like the War Powers Resolution a response to this dilemma, which is that it's for Congress, the more representative body of more of the country, to declare war as well as to authorize funds for war. And so it may be for the president to propose a course of action, but it really is for Congress to take the affirmative step of declaring war. It could also cut off uh, arms sales, incidentally. Congress right now doesn't want to actually take up its responsibilities to decide. So it's a systemic problem, but we do have the solution in front of us. When we decide whether to go to war or not, we have to understand the consequences for our own democracy. So much of the foreign policy debate over the last several decades is framed around, you know, should the United States use force to promote democracy, to promote American values, the American model elsewhere? The insight that John Quincy Adams showed in 1821 when he said that the United States should not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy, that the United States could become the dictatress of the world but would damage its own spirit. And so when I look at the war on terror, going back to 9-11, what I see is hatreds of foreigners became the basis for pursuing wars. Everybody told the American people this, and then along comes a candidate that the political establishment doesn't like, but says, yeah, foreigners really are trying to kill us, and they're right here. And they're immigrants, and we're being killed on trade. And the whole world really is against us, and we're against them. And people said, yeah, this, this makes sense, because we've been told that foreigners are gravely imperiling our whole way of life and our system of government for so long. So we now have to understand that when the United States engages in endless war, it's not a surprise that we jeopardize our own civic peace at home. Yeah, indeed. You know, you said something really interesting just now about promoting democracy, essentially through force. And the United States prides itself on being the shining example, which really it isn't anymore. It can't be with all the war that's happening. Is there a way for the U.S. to be this example and to promote democracy in other places without the use of force? We're spending a trillion dollars at the Pentagon now in tax dollars. Like, how can we spend that money in a way that promotes peace and democracy? Yeah, you know, almost any other way to spend the money, including just returning it to the taxpayers, would be more peaceful. Because right now, unfortunately, the United States is contributing to violence. And that's a very difficult thing to say. But I think that's the fact. But the United States, I think, should make a much greater investment in diplomacy, in trying to resolve conflicts, and not being on one side of the conflict and therefore unable to use its diplomatic influence to mediate and bring people together. So in the war on Yemen, it's indefensible that the United States is aiding the Saudi-led coalition to prosecute this brutal war. 
we should be using our power and influence to bring the parties together to try and end the war, not to fuel the war. So clearly, given the way that the U.S. diplomatic corps has been devastated, it's going to take a significant effort to rebuild the State Department and rebuild U.S. diplomatic capacity. That'll be a long-term project. And the other thing is that we actually do face significant challenges in the world. They're just mainly not of a geopolitical state-to-state kind. Climate change is one of those issues. In order to address climate change on the scale of the planet, it's going to require much greater trust and cooperation amongst the world states and peoples than we've been able to muster to date because the United States can do a Green New Deal at home, but that will not mean putting an end to global emissions. So we've got to set very clear priorities. And it so happens that in the 21st century, these planetary and transnational challenges are much greater than the challenges that exist state to state. Yes, we must promote vigorous diplomacy, no doubt, in order to solve these problems that are global and transnational, as you just said. So as an everyday person, what are two things I could be doing to support peace and demand from the government that they engage in diplomacy before making war and find solutions for global problems? The first thing is simply don't lower your critical faculties. Think carefully about who is saying what, for what goal, and uh, keep an open mind and and get diverse uh, sources of opinion and information on international issues. Because unfortunately, our political discourse on foreign policy matters, I'm afraid, is very blinkered at the moment, at least when it comes to the mainstream media. But thankfully, For better or worse, we have many different sources of information now that are easily accessible. And I hope, of course, that the Quincy Institute will be one of those places that people turn to to get our perspective. But the second thing is that I think uh, we've seen that grassroots mobilization matters. When people go to town halls, when they call right to members of Congress, politicians listen. The campaign to put an end to U.S. support for the Saudi-led coalition fighting in Yemen's civil war made a significant impact and caused Congress to buck the president and demand an end to U.S. support. It hasn't happened yet, but that's a very hopeful sign. I hope that we will see that uh, it will make a difference to American foreign policy going forward. Yes, that's totally on point. What is the source of your passion? I grew up uh, outside Washington, D.C., and 9-11 happened when I was in high school. I paid a lot of attention to the debate surrounding how the United States should respond to that horrific attack. I actually really didn't know what the United States should do initially. But as I pursued my studies and follow what was happening, I saw our country fail to learn what I thought were the lessons of that mistake. And that's kind of why I pursued a PhD in history to get a longer range viewpoint and gain some perspective. In a funny way, that's maybe suited me for the current moment where unexpected things are happening. I'm not so taken aback by them because I've studied how the United States very quickly, for example, decided that it should be the leading power in the world early in World War II. Change can happen very slowly or not at all. It can happen very quickly sometimes. My uh, source of passion and interest comes from feeling like my own viewpoint was not really represented in American politics for some time. Now there is an opportunity to make that point and somehow make some meaning out of some great difficulties that we've had and, unfortunately, violence that the United States has inflicted on others. In a way, it was truer to my own purposes to leave academia because I felt very strongly that the opportunity for 
significant change to make the world and the United States more peaceful existed. Fantastic. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? I think right now a lot of people are scared given our politics. We're in a dangerous moment. But in a strange way, I feel a little bit more hopeful too. I found it troubling when political debate was so sterile, actually. I don't know that it's sterile now. It's got other problems. There's a lot of passion, especially when I see what the generations of people that I teach, what the younger generation is already introducing into our politics. That really makes me hopeful. I think the generational turnover will change U.S. foreign policy. The question is, how do we move from here to there? And that's uh, not an easy question, but hopefully one that I'll be able to play some small part in affecting. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. When we think about foreign policy, we don't often think about civic engagement. But actually, engagement with our elected representatives has often been a prominent part. Just think of the protests about the Vietnam War. Endless wars jeopardize civic peace here at home, and not just because we may be protesting. It's also starting to unravel the very fabric of a nation with immigrant roots. Stephen is right that we have not thought in a long time about the world through a lens beyond U.S. military primacy. We're not actively asking and discussing whether world peace can be achieved through dominance or whether using force to promote democracy is actually successful. And even whether we should be including the voices of refugees and those who serve in our military into our public discourse and our foreign policy making. In a world that requires more and more collaboration to solve global issues like the climate crisis, we should think more about how we can be mediators, how we can resolve conflicts. This conversation is a reminder that civic engagement still works. When we go to town halls and demand a different policy, our representatives do listen and very often respond accordingly. Next week, our guests are Jane Souter and David Farrell of the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland. They embarked on an ambitious project to bring citizens into the heart of debates over constitutional and political reforms and improve how the Irish representative system of democracy operates. We'll be talking about the capacity of a deliberative form of democracy to bring people who previously felt adrift and disconnected from power to become more interested in politics and feel more positive about their ability to influence it. Normally, politicians assume that all citizens want is more spending and less taxes. But in fact, this group of citizens, when they were presented with balanced evidence from right-wing economists and left-wing economists, trade union people, business and employer and industry type people, they agreed that in fact in some areas they should pay more taxes. And there were particular areas then that they really didn't want the government to cut spending in. So they came to compromises, they came to nuanced kind of policy positions. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos.